everyone ready? <laughs> We are about to start the, the next lecture. So yeah, it is my pleasure to introduce Fisher Yu. He is currently uh, an assistant professor at our ETS Zurich. He leads the visual intelligence systems groups at our computer vision lab there. And so he got his PhD from uh, Princeton, and afterward he did his postdoc at uh, Berkeley. I think with Trevor Darrell, working with Trevor Darrell, which is another really big name. And he made a lot of our uh, influential contributions in computer vision. And to name a few that I know of, is uh, he made the LSAN dataset which some of you might have uh, used it for scene classifications. And he, uh, he proposed this clever ideas of our dilated convolution, which are sort of allows you to, 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 for the model to have larger receptive field. And I think more recently, he also uh, made the Berkeley Deep Drive dataset, which is a very, cool data set that has like a lot of camera information with a lot of metadata. And then you can use it for a lot of tasks. For example, object detection, object tracking. And I think he will talk more about it in his lecture. So yes, uh, it is a really great opportunity for us to have a chance to learn from him. So thank you for coming. And let's start. Okay. Thanks for the warm introduction. Yeah, so as introduced, I'm Fisher Yu. I'm currently working at ET Zurich, um, and I'm leading a group working on computer vision problems. So as you can tell, I was actually uh, born in Asia, and I, uh, I was in China when, before college, and then I spent quite some time in the US. So now I moved to Switzerland. So, by the way, uh, Switzerland is not Sweden, so it's very common. <laughs> it's a common, uh, very uh, confusion. So Switzerland is in the middle of e Europe, and has a lot of mountains, and uh, with many great skiing resorts. So actually, even now, you can go to uh, Switzerland and uh, ski in the glacier. So it's supposed to be a cold place, but when I when come to Thailand, I realized that the indoor temperature is much colder here. <laughs> So, yeah, that's why like, I'm, in, I'm in my jacket, and I feel lucky that I, ha I chose to do so. So today, I'm going to cover 4D scene understanding. I believe that it is a quite interesting topic and currently deserve a lot of attention in computer vision. So first of all, what is 4D understand, uh, scene understanding? So basically, every one of us is living in a dynamic 3D environment. For example, when we drive our car on the road, we have our like, self-driving car to make decisions in this dynamic environment in 3D. We have to know that where the other cars are, where they, they came from, and where they will be in the future. And the same for the other type of objects. So we need to collect all those uh, 4D information in order to make a decision for our own like, uh, vehicle. For example, if we know that some people is crossing, then the car should stop. And if we, we know that if the, if the car in front of us is slowing, then we should slow as well. So this is a part of motivation we need to do a 4D scene understanding. Not only we need to understand the 3D, but we also need to understand the temporal domain of the 3D environment. And of course, the whole 3D environment has been keep changing. Uh, not only in autonomous driving or in other scene, even for uh, some other applications, for example, for the indoor robots. So we are all foreseeing that in not so distant future, every one of us will have our, a robot in our home, either for entertaining or for uh, helping with the household work. So because those robots are living together with human, and they, the robots need to understand that where the humans are and the, where they will be in the future. So this actually constructs another dynamic environment that those robots need to live in and need to recognize. 
So our goal here is to build those perception modules or perception models such that our robo future robots can recognize uh, those, can, do, can process all the information in those 4D environment. And of course, even, even nowadays, if we talk about the existing applications, we are talking about, for example, uh, auto automated markets where, you know, like in some places in the US, Amazon is pushing very hard to have stores without any cashier. So basically you walk in and then you just grab what you want and then walk out. So you do not need to do any payment, do, do not need to, uh, like, say, inter <laughs> like say, do not need to interact with anyone else, uh, just to grab what you need and go. So in this, in this case, there are many sensors in this environment, and they also need to understand the dynamics of the environment, like where the people are and where they will, be, they will go, in order to know that what they actually do in the environment, and in order to make sure they charge you properly. Okay, so those are the motivations or potential applications for us to work on 4D scene understanding. So basically, when we so, uh, work on this problem, we try to build the foundational algorithms and software for 4D scene understanding. And the, our goal here is to build the perceptual module like based on monocular views, just like a human. So we take the uh, videos either uploaded by a user or uh, uploaded by our intelligent device and then process them from different aspects using different type of algorithms and hopefully using a single model to process all of them and then pro provide all the information we need in the environment such that the downstream uh, applications like robots or uh, automated market or intelligent env environment can make uh, smart decisions. So that's, um, that's basically why we are working on 4D C understanding. And in today's lecture, I will talk about some basic components of 4D C understanding and hopefully stir some interest uh, in you on to do research in this area and point to some promising directions here. So the goal of this lecture, so we have three hours, and I learned that this is the only lecture focusing on computer vision in the whole summer school. And we also have a very diverse audience um, here. So I hope that everyone can learn something uh, about computer vision uh, from this, no matter whether you are, have no idea about what is computer vision or you're already doing research in this area. So, and therefore, I will cover the basics in a nutshell uh, quickly. So in some part, you may feel it's boring, but I hope that you, you can always find some part uh, entertaining informant, uh, inform, uh, inform, like informative for you. Uh, and, in, uh, and especially in the second part of the lecture, I will focus more on presenting the ideas of latest computer vision uh, advance. So it's worth noting that um, because we have limited time and I cannot cover everything like in, relate, uh, in relation to 4D understanding. And some parts of, in some components, I probably present my view on how we can solve different components. And therefore, it can also give you an idea like what the research we are doing um, you know, in my group. So I hope that uh, those can serve as a good lead for you to continue uh, studying and investigating uh, those topics. All right, so for 4D scene understanding, um, I will break it down into several uh, basic components. So first of all, given a language, we need to have a basic understanding, or given an image, we need to have some basic understanding what is in the image. And usually we call that image encoding. And after that, when we have the image encoding or representation of the image, we will do object detection to find out all the objects we are interested in. And then on top of that, do object tracking, basically understand the motion of the objects. Uh, and then after that, we need to do instant segmentation to have some uh, like semantics or pixel level information about those objects. And then even though we are looking at the scene from a 2D view, just like human eyes, we have no trouble of looking at the 2D view from single eye and still see the 3D environment. And I will talk about like current uh, ideas and advance in 3D estimation from monocular views. And in the, in the end, we hope that we can have the whole shape uh, estimation about each object and about the environment as well, such that we can have every bit of information about the environment. 
All right, so that is the plan for this afternoon. First of all, uh, let's start with basic image encoding. So when we want to encode the image, the first question we want to ask is, what is what's in an image? So let's say you see an image like this. What you immediately see is, of course, the famous uh, scientist, uh, Albert Einstein. So, and of course, the image can be represented in many different ways. Let's say if I resize the image down into half, you'll probably see the same, you'll probably see the same thing. Um, and uh, you will say that, okay, those two images are exactly the same. However, if we ask a computer, uh, they may say something different. So the, those two images are completely different because there are no two pixels are exactly the same between the original one and the resized one. And even worse, let's say if we, I rotate the image, then um, like from human eyes, we still see the same image, just as a different place. However, if we look, ask computer, like what do you see? The computer will tell us that, oh, I, can, I see the completely different data from the previous image. Um, and that's the, the problem with that is, when we talk about computer vision, we have to start from not the human eye representation, we have to start with computer representation. And computer represents the image with pixels. So, and uh, like just to say, if we downsample the image enough, then you will see the pixels. Um, and uh, we see a continue, we see the image, uh, not because uh, there's no pixel, just mostly because the pixels are so small that we no longer see them. And that's what, what's happening on our like cell phone screen or computer screen. But in the end, if we zoom in enough, we will actually have the a pixel, like the individual cell, to represent the whole image. And just let's just to say each gray pixel can have uh, eight bits, which have which can represent 256 values. Then even for a 1,000 by 1,000 image, by, which is by today's standard, it's not very high res image. It can have many many combinations. Uh, it's a very big number. It's just to put it there to scare you. Um, and if you are not scared, so in comparison, if you ask a scientist what are the number of items in the universe, it's this number. So it's much smaller than number of combinations or number of images uh, you can represent with this 1,000 by 1,000 image grid. So that's actually essentially the difficulty of for computer to see the image. The computer are not seeing like a person, or they are not seeing like a head, or they are not seeing anything we are intuitively seeing. They are only seeing pixels. So the first thing to solve this problem is to encode the image properly such that it can give us the information we are seeing uh, at a high level. So the intuition there is even if we have so many combinations, even on 1,000 by 1,000 image grid, but not all the combinations are meaningful. Like say, there can be some, like a lot of the combination of pixels can be just random or no noise. Uh, and uh, even more importantly, not all images are, say, meaningfully different. As we just saw, if I resize the image or rotate the image, we still see the same, we still see the same subject. So, at a high level, we still say that they are the same. But at a low level, they are uh, from different image combination. So that's basically the task of image encoding and why this is usually the first component when we uh, talk about, uh, when we do perform computer vision tasks. So image encoding aims to extract meaningful information from the images for different vision tasks. So it depends on which literature or which background you come from. Sometimes people are also called also call that uh, embedding or feature, depending on the context. So it's also also worth noting that nowadays, uh, when we talk about image encoding, um, there is isn't a big discrepancy or difference between low level tasks or high level tasks. So usually when we say high level tasks, it means that we do recognition task. Uh, we want to recognize person. We want to recognize cars from the image. And when we talk about low level, low level vision, we are usually talking about the traditional Im image processing tasks, 
like super resolution, image restoration, image denoising. So nowadays there are basically uh, no distinct difference between those uh, two things. We all just extract image encoding or extract features from images. So to test whether you have very good image encoding or not, we usually use image classification as a proxy task uh, to test uh, whether your encoding is good, in, or good or not. So the, actually the, the reason will actually come out uh, gradually from the, our lecture. So you will see that why image classification is a good proxy uh, for, this, for testing the image encoding. All right. So image coding has always been in the central stage of computer vision. And as you're probably all aware, uh, the computer vision or the image representation has been in a distinct change uh, in 2012. So before 2012, what people do is basically two steps to extract features and uh, learn those features. We first do, uh, design, like manually design feature extractors to transform the pixel into a different space. So for example, in this case, let's say this is an image, and then this is the like, image of a transformation. And this transformation is usually based on like, a, a study of human eyes. We first uh, try to understand that what human eyes are sensitive to. For example, uh, we are sensitive to gradients and sensitive to like, a distinct color change. And therefore, we hypothesize that that's what computer, computer also need. Therefore, and uh, we design the features to extract those information. And after that, after we extract the, the pixel or even image level information, we usually use certain learning algorithm to select and classify the features. So this usually we use SVM or we can also use some other machine learning algorithms like a random forest, et cetera. So it's worth no, uh, noting that um, there are many different types of uh, manually designed features. So for example, um, people have been designing the filter bank based on GAPU filter. So and the, the inspiration there is actually from psychology or cognitive, uh, cognitive science. People, um, in those area, people first study that how human eyes work. Um, even though we do not have the full answer, but we do uh, have some basic understanding that, for example, um, human eyes will be very sensitive to change in those directions. And then, therefore, uh, we are designing filters like this. And on the other hand, for ex uh, we also do say difference of, difference of Gaussians because we also hypothesis that human eyes are very sensitive to scale change. And the way to extract that is to say convolve the same image with different kernel size of like different uh, Gaussian filters with diff different kernel size and take the difference. So those are the basic ideas to extract the features. And again, uh, they look like they are, let's say, filter. And in other words, they are convolutional. And then we basically try to design different convolutional filters to extract the meaningful feature and hope that the downstream machine learning algorithm like SVM or Random Forest can figure out how to use those features. All right, so that's, uh, at the 2012, uh, one thing happened. So we all know that there is a very famous challenge called ImageNet, and it's one of the uh, large-scale challenge uh, for computer vision. So for many years, people, has been, uh, people have been competing on it. For example, in 2010, uh, we achieved the top five error rate around uh, like 28 or something. And then in 2011, uh, we have the performance of 26. Uh, and in 2012, following the same idea, so we have something like 25. Uh, this is error rate, of course, the lower the better. And clearly, we are seeing progress. So if there, like, basically the field has been expecting, okay, things are working well. Let's just expecting that we reduce this error rate for another decade or two. Um, and then eventually, we may solve the computer vision. However, the big change come in in 2012 with the deep learning AlexNet, which actually shaved the error rate to like dramatically and well below 20% error rate. 
So that get people alert, and then realize that okay, maybe uh, we should uh, stop designing our own features, and we should just like deep learn. Uh, we have just do design deep learning model such that we can uh, have the model to learn the filters by the, by itself. So, actually, at the very beginning, many people are quite skeptical. So even though that the deep learning of uh, the like LexNet or the deep convolutional network can do very well in image classification, um, but many like top scientists are suspicious that this success can be carried to the other computer vision tasks, because after all, uh, image classification is only one of the simplest tasks in computer vision. It only requires one label from the whole image. And for many computer vision tasks, we need to have more structural or relation information. For example, in object detection, people have studied that how different objects are related to each other in order to use that as a prayer for object detection. And therefore, there has been a lot of thought on whether deep learning models can learn those like, more complex structure and relations. Um, and now you know the result. So after like almost a decade of efforts by computer vision researchers. Now we know that basically there's no area in computer vision that shouldn't use deep learning. And uh, we basically have state-of-art models of deep learning on all areas. So there, and therefore, convolution networks has been in a major role in computer vision uh, up to now. And it's still a very popular network, especially if you want to, say, design, apply computer vision into certain application area, especially on embedded device, uh, computer vision, uh, the convolutional networks is still a top choice. Uh, at the same time, uh, since 2017, a transformer came into the scene. It's quite, uh, so generally speaking, it's still deep learning. Um, you can still call it deep neural networks, but it still is no longer convolutional. Uh, or technically speaking, convolutional networks is translational environment, but uh, transformer become permutation, permutation environment. So in other words, it's becoming uh, it's a po more powerful type of deep neural network. Uh, and uh, when we are thinking about what is the right architecture today, there is, uh, we are still studying and researching like whether, how we can make trade-off between transformer and the convolutional network. Well, that's probably a little bit too much digress. But let's come back to uh, convolution. So in the next uh, several, uh, um, like a part, several slides, I will introduce the basic components of convolution in case you do not understand the basic concepts. Uh, well, the morning session has already given you some mathematical description about what is a convolution. Uh, now I hope that I can give you some intuition on what they're actually doing. So of course, uh, no matter how you describe it. So essentially, convolution is a local dot product between a kernel matrix and the input matrix. Um, and of course, it's not a, uh, it's not a com traditional matrix multiplication. It's like a convolution. So basically, you are sliding a window, sliding the kernel on the input image and calculate the output. So even though that we can have many simplified uh, calculation of convolution. But it's worth noting that there are many theories around convolution, and this has been playing a very important role in signal processing um, and in many other fields. But here we just take the simple view of it, like think of, just think of it as a local dot product. Okay, so here is an illustration what is that. So let's say this is the input matrix, and the, the green part is uh, green part is the the kernel we are having here, um, or green part is the output of the calculation, and the kernel is like one two uh, is on the lower left of uh, lower right of each cell. So you can see that while we are sliding the kernel on the image, we are gradually calculating the results of the convolution.
And of course, uh, there are, if you want to have some bigger image or have some bigger outputs, then you can pad the input, you can pad the input matrix or input image with zero or, zero or something. And of course, this is only on 2D. In many cases, uh, we are uh, thinking about multi-dimension in both inputs and outputs, and also in, pr in terms of number of kernels. So this is actually quite natural, because when we think about uh, just normal images, we are talking about RGB, RGB image. It's already a three-channel image, or three matrix concatenated together. So we can easily extend that into like multiple channels. Basically, each kernel can take inputs from uh, multiple channels, and then each kernel will generate one channel. So for example, in this case, we have two input channels, and uh, we, have, uh, we have three kernels on each row. Then the output, the output of this calculation is a three-channel uh, th three image. So essentially, a uh, convolution is a linear operation. So it's a linear combination of the in input uh, elements to form the output. Um, and in computer vision, you know, there are many people working on it and uh, people from different backgrounds. And therefore, the, uh, the terminology may be a little bit confusing. Uh, just to make, uh, refer to, uh, make, it, make it easier to read the papers, normally when the kernel is the same size as the input, um, people also call it fully connected because each output uh, position is connected to any input any uh, every input elements on the input image. And another extreme is the kernel size is one. Um, sometimes people call that is MLP, multi-layer perceptual. So essentially it says that it's only uh, treating the input image or the input multiple channels as a linear, uh, as a sequence of linear vectors. And then we just uh, process each uh, sequence or process each channel position separately. So actually to call it multi-layer perception, it's not accurate because a multi-layer perception usually means that you have already have multiple layers. Yes? Yes. How the are the kernel repeated? Yeah. Uh, so in the back end, the convolution is implemented as a correlation operation, and so uh, that means it's like a Hadamard product instead of like uh, doing it three by three uh, yeah. many times. So um, is that like in that case, will the same three by three kernel be repeated? Um, up to the shape of the input, or uh, how is that implementation? Now? Okay, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so there is no fi fixed answer to that. Um, and uh, yeah, so first of all, usually how we mathematically represent the operation is different from how we actually implement it because it's also uh, hardware dependent. Um, on CPU, it's usually a direct uh, implementation, but we all know that now we are running the convolution on GPU, which is CMD, which uh, is very good at, it's basically is a single instruction, multiple data. So it's very good, it's very good at a computation where you have the duplicate, um, duplicate complication uh, everywhere. So, um, okay, I, it's a little bit hard to explain, but the actual implementation, or at least the, um, the, like the common implementation of convolution, is much more dumber than you see from the, uh, f uh, from the uh, formulation. So what people do there is, let's say if we want to do a three by three convolution, we will first, uh, Let's say, 
here. I will first extract this nine element into a, into a vector. And then extract this nine by nine element into another vector. You all may ask me, wait a minute. So for the overlapping, we are duplicated elements. The answer is yes. We are, we are essentially uh, duplicating all the elements such that uh, we, can, we can rearrange the input um, so, so in the way that it can be directly expressed as a matrix simplification with the kernel. So that's basically a traditional trade-off uh, for GPU. Basically, you use a lot of memory, but the compute can be very fast. And of course, at some, at some point, the, the memory can also be very expensive. You may run out of local memory, run out of shared memory, you can you may even run out of global memory. There are several types of memory on GPU. So therefore, later, later people are also gradually um, like designing more sophisticated library to deal with all those cases. And nowadays, basically, everything is encapsulated into a QDN library, like released by NVIDIA. And nobody knows what's happening. Uh, but just like, say, if you want to implement your own GPU kernel, to do the convolution efficiently, um, like in implementing in a way that will waste a lot of memory is actually the most efficient to do this. All right. So actually, it's also worth it's also worth noting that people have tried to use faster Fourier transform uh, to accelerate convolution, um, and then of course. Uh, you are not seeing it these days. Uh, it's mostly because it turns out that is the complication of that uh, is so is so big um, that then it just even though complex in terms of computational complexity, theoretically it's faster, but just in practice in practice it's not. So nowadays we are just turning to the naive implementation, convert the convolution into a matrix simplification and go from there. All right. So of course, uh, when we are talking about convolution, deep convolution network, we are talking about we have multiple layers of convolution by definition. And uh, you may ask uh, how deep is deep? Well, if it's, you feel it's deep, then it's deep. Um, so yeah, so you may ask is two layer deep layer network, a three layer a deep network? Uh, it's very subjective. However, so because each layer, or each convolution itself is a linear operation, even if you put multiple layers together, or multiple convolution together, um, it's still a linear operation. And we all, of course we know that the world is not, like, is not linear. And if we want to model the real world, especially the pixels we are talking about here, uh, we need to go way beyond the linear models. And to achieve that, we need to introduce additional uh, components, especially the nonlinear layers, the pooling, downsampling, and the normalization. So for nonlinear layers, uh, that's essentially to uh, make, the, uh, make the linear operation nonlinear uh, somehow. So there are several uh, things you can try. Uh, for example, sigmoid like function, tangent hyperbolic function, and what people are now using most is rectify the linear unit or some variants of it. The idea of those units is when the value is greater than zero, then it's linear. If it's less than zero, then it's either zero, it's either zero, zero out, like in ReLU, or become like much uh, less uh, influential, like in the leaky ReLU. So the goal, the, re the rationale there is uh, instead of doing fit the whole model or the whole like original function with a joint linear function. We want to fit the original function piece with a piecewise linear function. So the piecewise linear is represented by this uh, turning point. Basically it says that um, if your value here is greater than zero, then we, I'm, I think that we will use your value. And if the value is less than zero, then we will mutate. It's not used here. 
Um, and essentially, we are saying that in, if in very high dimension, uh, we are fitting your whole model with some piecewise linearity. And uh, another important operation is pooling. Pooling is very similar to convolution, but it calculates as a value from a kernel area of the input. So for example, we usually do max pooling or average pooling. So here is a, like a simple illustration of average pooling. So for maximum pooling, it's the same. Just like within this range, we find the maximum element uh, and then put, put it in the output. So it's worth noting that so average pooling is good. Average pooling is uh, just a special kind of convolution. It's a convolution with every kernel elements to be one, or to be like one nice. Um, but for maximum pooling, it's a little bit challenging um, because it's, you only have you only preserve the value that is the biggest. And people make uh, at the be at the very beginning, people are questioning that whether it's a good thing or not because the gradient doesn't seem to be very favorable. Uh, and the later we find that it's actually okay as long as your function is uh, differentiable almost everywhere. Uh, well, that can be defined rigorously mathematically. Um, we, uh, like, or in other words, if as long if it, we the deep learning optimization can tolerate some some discontinuous point in the function, and as long as all like in all the measurable components there are differentiable, then your function is good, can be plugged into the uh, deep learning net models. Um, and another very important operation is down sampling. Basically, when we do convolution, we slice the kernel like a one pixel at a time. But in stride, it's measured at how much we jump uh, in this process. For example, here, if the stride is two, then instead of moving the kernel into uh, one, uh, one location at a time, we move it at the time. And in this case, we achieve the dump sampling effect. Okay, normalization. Normalization is a little bit harder to explain. Um, it's related to another very big uh, topic called covariance shift. But in a nutshell, what it does is, so when the output of the convolution models, or each convolution layer, can have very strange distribution. What the normalization does is we hope that after a layer, your data can be zero mean and can have limit can have a controlled uh, standard deviation. In other words, we hope that the distribution of the layer outputs can be well modeled, in the sense that uh, we know where is the mean, we know that how big the distribution is, and therefore we can uh, the basic version of normalization is to say within a batch, we first uh, calculate the mean and the variance, and then we divide, we subtract the, the all the value with the mean, and then divide it by the standard deviation. So this is one way of doing the normalization. There are also many other ways of doing normalization. They have all their own uh, trade-offs, but the basic idea is the same. We want to constrain the data uh, or the outputs of a layer such that it had it, the distribution of the data is well modeled. All right, so with all those components, now we can uh, put everything together uh, have, uh, and have AlexNet. Basically, this is the, as we mentioned, this is the first convolution network that is competitive on the internet. Um, and the, even though we call it a deep convolution net network, but the best standard is actually quite doffed. So it only has seven, seven layers. Um, and uh, at each layer, it uh, has a combination of convolution uh, and uh, uh, pooling. So basically, with pooling, we also do a striding to gradually downsample the resolution of the feature map. And in the end, we have uh, dense layers or fully connected layers to reduce the resolution to one, such that we can do the classification for the whole image. So there are uh, several things worth mentioning here. Um, so before uh, AlexNet, the major method are SVM plus many manual features or sparse coding. Um, and after that, we are basically now only doing like learn, learn feature learnings. 
and we find that the uh, ReLU uh, is a very good uh, linearity, and that's basically what we are using nowadays. So before this, uh, even though people have been using uh, linear layers, uh, but we um, find that the older nonlinear layer, like a sigmoid function, can be a big barrier in optimization. So ReLU is much easier to optimize because it's part of it is linear, um, and it still can represent a very complicated function. So it's using its own normalization, but it's not, not uh, commonly used right now, so we can just ignore that. Uh, and then the final layer is fully connected to reduce the resolution from uh, 7 by 7 to uh, to one. And to come back overfitting, we also have the dropout and the additional data augmentation here. So the optimization is a big topic, on how we can optimize the models. And again, so the morning session can actually discuss that extensively, so therefore I won't dive into the details. But there is, I want to mention here that uh, like all the layers are differentiable, even though that they are not dif dif well, let's say they are not dis differentiable uh, at a certain point, but as long as like, they are differentiable at almost everywhere, then that's good enough. Uh, and then we can calculate uh, gradients of all the variables with chain rule, and uh, then optimize the network with the stochastic gradient descent. So that is uh, AdcNet, and after that, we have been, uh, there are many works on studying that how we can further go get this net network deeper uh, using, the, uh, using various techniques. Um, the most successful of them is probably the residual network, and also called ResNet. So the idea is actually very simple, but the effect is so dramatic that even nowadays, like even in Transformer, we are still using this. So the idea here is, let's say we have a, a couple of convolution, like three by three convolution. And then instead of only passing the input data to the, three by, to the layers of three by three convolution and then pass the results into, say, the next layers, we have a residual connection. Just simply add this result to the output of these two layers. So that's what is called a residual connection. Uh, and that actually worked quite well. And that basically can help us to extend the model to hundreds of layers. And it's worth noting that uh, even though this is very simple, but many variations of this actually do not work, uh, interestingly. So for example, you can, uh, you can say instead of doing an addition, let's be smarter, let's learn a weight, like a, learn a weighted sum of those two values and put them together. And it turns out that this is uh, not um, as robust as just adding them together. Um, and there are only one thing that seems to be uh, effective, which is concatenate these two values together. Uh, and uh, you probably heard there is a model called DanceNet actually do that. Uh, and uh, uh, the problem of that is it will blow up your memory because when you concatenate them, so when you uh, all, like, uh, recursively concatenate all of them, then you are expanding the number of channels uh, rapidly. So with addition, you are not adding more channels, just put the two things together. And that's why it's simple and effective. That's what uh, people are keep using it nowadays. So with the uh, residual modules, we can extend the layer, in, like we can re extend the model uh, to much deeper. Um, and nowadays, we can, like, uh, we can say even use the same, same model to get 100 layers models or 200 layers models. And it's worth noting that uh, this is basically the structure of, of most of models uh, nowadays. Say we start with some input size, like say uh, 254, uh, 254 by 254, and then we gradually reduce the, we gradually reduce uh, the image input resolution or the feature resolution. And within each, com within each resolution, we will have multiple layers. So we can think of the whole model to be divided into several stages. Each stage has its own input feature resolution. Um, and then within each stage, all the feature resolution are the same, and we just keep using uh, some modules. Like here, we use a sequential uh, residual module to process the input feature. And after we feel that we are doing it uh, enough, 
then we reduce resolution and then pass it into the next stage. So it's actually working quite well. So for example, after we adding the, for example, in this curve, this is the training curve of training curve of um, the ResNet. So let's say this um, after like the Sinner curve is the one that is not using, uh, not using the, oh, this, this curve is the one that is not using the residual connection. And you can see that after we use the recursion, uh, residual connection on the right, all the curves are becoming much lower, which means that even on training, the model is converging much faster uh, and then converge to like a lower uh, classification error. Yes? What, what happens to the model when the error jumps down? Oh, you mean here? Oh. You mean here? So that's the optimization part. Um, at a, so at that time, when we talk about when we do optimization, we use a step learning rate. Say we start with learning rate 0 0.1, and then we train the model. Actually, the parameter here is we train the model for 30 epochs, which means that we go through the whole data for 30 times, and then we reduce the learning rate by 10. And this is what, um, this jump is when you reduce the learning rate, then the model quickly find a better local minimum uh, for the model. And then you train it for some more time, the model uh, gradually converge um, at this learning rate, and then you reduce the learning rate again, and then it find a better local minimum. So this is uh, actually very interesting pheno phenomenon. Even though you see that the curve here almost uh, flat, and even for the ResNet, it's almost a flat. But if we do not train them for, for those times, then eventually, even if you drop the learning rate, the model won't converge to the uh, better, to the, the right local minimum. So it's actually quite interesting phenomenon, and it's still mysterious. We do not know what the model is doing over there. Somehow, like those random jumping uh, without making progress is helpful. All right, so yeah, so basically from here, we have kind of fixed the structure for all the convolution network. Usually we have a module, which is a convolution network, a convolution uh, layer with special norm plus ReLU, and we treat that as a module, and then all the model just keep stacking them. Um, and uh, we have here, we have step learning rate, but nowadays we have also other type of change of learning rate. Um, yeah, so because of batch norm, we no longer need dropout, and the residual connection seems to cure the vanishing gradient, which means that when the model is very deep, we can still train them very well. So there are many papers uh, followed on, and they explain why residual connection is a good idea. Um, but the conclusion here is with residual connection, we can train models, either convolution or transformer models, or tension-based models with more than 100 layers. So overall, uh, what we are observing here is, say, given image, if we want to classify it, then we put pass the image into a structure like this. Say, at each, uh, at each level, we do convolution, uh, process the inputs, and then reduce the resolution by half, and then do some more processing and reduce again. And in the end, when, when we get bored, we just use a fully connected layers and then process the whole, all the information to, pr to produce the final output. And this is the structure have been used in many different type of uh, models, like from starting from AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, or uh, recently the one of the most popular model is called Swing Transformer. So it's also used this type of overall structure. All right, so since we are now in 2013, so we have to talk about transformer. <laughs> yeah, so 23. Uh, the, ins the inside of uh, convolution is like a local filtering is a good, good idea, or it's good trade-off between computation and expressiveness. And calculating the correlation between features and the pre-trained uh, pre kernels 
can give us a lot of information. And especially, that is actually quite aligned with our traditional view of uh, feature extraction. Even though that now we do not uh, design those filters, we learn those filters, but learn the filter is actually very similar to what we got um, if we are designing them. So for example, when we uh, visualize the low-level features of Xnet, it's very, very similar to the traditional future we designed for Gabu filter, based on Gabu filter. Um, but in Transformer, we take a different approach. We introduce a global attention. Uh, basically, we try to connect all the pixels or all the locations in our feature map together. And then we first calculate a correlation between all pairs of image or feature pairs. And in, uh, in the Transformer world, we call them patch tokens. And then we apply a multi-layer perception. Usually it's a single layer on each of the, on each of the token. So of course, the one reason that we can do this, like we can do this global attention instead of calculating the local correlation is because we have much more powerful GPU RAM nowadays. And then make this cal calculation feasible. So in the world of attention, there are, in the world of transformer, there are several terminology. So in abject, uh, there are several, uh, several components. There is a query, key, and value. So they, uh, like let's say abjectively, I will t discuss how those can correspond to image processing uh, very soon. And then the output is the value vector uh, with the product of softmax attention of correlation between Q and K. Basically, this is the calculation here. We first calculate the, we first calculate the like matrix product or, or correlation between all the rows or columns of Q and K. And then get the correlation divided by the dimension. Then it's basically a modulation, make sure the correlation is not too big such that the softmax is well conditioned. And then after we get the correlation between Q and K, uh, modulated by softmax, then we will use that to get an average sum for, uh, for every entry in V uh, or in the value. So all of them are matrix, and you can think of the here are each, like each matrix is composed of rows. Um, and the, in the end, we are doing a recomposition of rows in V. Yes. Uh, what is exponential? Like, uh, isn't the space of correlations of feature patches like exponential in the number of feature patches that can exist in an image? Like, uh, all combinations of correlations means like. Uh, well, it's ex certainly not exponential, but it's quadratic. Uh, I don't. I don't understand how it can be like. Uh, what exponential regard in regard to what? Well, um, if, I, if I look at correlations, then it will at least be two power uh, the number of uh, feature patches, right? Let's say there are k feature patches, then there are at least two power k uh, correlations. Two power of k? Yeah. Correlations? Uh, between each and every pair, right? Or some kind of combination of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's quadratic. So if uh, say you have an... Say if you have n rows in K, and you have n rows in Q. Uh, basically, uh, you are um, do uh, you are trying calculating the correlation between each of those n entries, which is n times n. So okay. that's a quadratic, not a exponential. Okay. Thanks. Okay, but indeed it's uh, much more compli uh, it's much more uh, expensive than a convolution. So one thing you have to be careful about the softmax and also one why we are dividing by uh, by the by the dimension uh, dk here. So this is actually a very common error you may see when you tune your own model. Let's just to say if we want to calculate softmax of 
two simple values. Uh, what can go wrong there? Let's say if one value is one, the other value is 20, what do you think you can get out of softmax? Or let's say one value is one, the other value is 100. If you do softmax of those two values, what can happen? Any clue? Uh, not clip to the lowest value, but like softmax is basically we need to calculate exponential of each value, like exponential of one, like e to the power one, and e to the power one hundred, and then calc and calculate uh, the say sum, and then divide each entry by the sum. That is softmax. So if one value is e to the power of one hundred it can be disastrous for GPU. Because usually we use floating point 32, or nowadays using floating point 16 to do the, calcula to do the calculation. Um, if we directly, say, take a exponential of a very large number, then that will become an NAN. An. Um, There's co a very common problem you when you see the model diverge then it will give you infin infinity or n a n. So it's very annoying bug in uh, in tuning models, but usually it's come from the like come from softmax. All right. So this may be a little bit, uh, more abstract, uh, but it's actually the same thing. We just make it a higher dimension. What we are doing here is let's say we have still the three value uh, v k q. Um, and instead of directly calculate the attention here in this way, uh, we first pass each V by a linear layer. Like we just do some transformation of the transformation of the matrix. And then we can calculate the, dot, uh, the attention uh, in this way. But here we can pass the KQV into different uh, linear layers. We call different head. So in this case, we are, say, we given the matrix V, matrix K, matrix Q, and then we transform in them into different ways, uh, into a new V, new K, new Q, and then we do the self-attention. In the end, we can concatenate the results together. The goal here is to, like we call this multi-head attention. Essentially, we want to get a more uh, diverse or more um, variety of attention based on different transformation. And of course, the linear transformation is learned such that we can get some, or, uh, we can learn what will be the right way to calculate the attention between the inputs. And that's all you need in order to build a transformer. So if we want to use transformer for a vision task, we will first uh, break them down, uh, break the image down into small patches. And usually we break them down into 16 by 16 patch. Let's say if the original image is, um, say, 256 by 256, then we divide the image by 16 by 16 patch. Uh, how many tokens we, do we have in the end? Can anyone give me a quick answer? How many? Yeah, it's 16 by 16 because if you, if the image size is 256 by 256, then you will have uh, 16 patches or 16 by 16 patches in this way. And therefore, in the end, you will have 256 tokens or six, 256 patch. So it's a patch in for the images, but for transformer, it's token. So we treat them as a token. Uh, and then when we do the, when we use the transformer on the input image, uh, we basically treat the same token as our same treat the same token tokenized the matrix both as v q uh, k and q so you can think of in this case the v will have two uh, 256 tokens and each token have 
um, 256 dimension because each patch has uh, 16 by 16 pixels. So of course, uh, remember that we have this linear, uh, linear layer. The linear layer can transform each token into a different dimension. But we still have 256 tokens. We use the same token. Uh, we use the same vector both as the uh, k, q, uh, k, uh, v, and q. Then we do the self. We do we pass it into the multi head attention. In this case, because uh, all the values are the same, we also call them self attention. Basically, we calculate the call the calculate the attention for this for the same value. So okay, on the right, that's basically the structure we are having here. Each uh, each uh, for each layer, we first pass all the tokens into a normalization. Uh, here uh, we usually use layer norm, uh, but similar very similar to batch norm, and then pass it into multi head attention. And you can see that here the residual connection is still uh, the residual connection is still over there to make sure to make the model easier easy easy to train. And after that, we will have another normalization layer and pass it into a multi-layer perception, basically to another like a linear layer, just to shuffle things out. Okay, so we call this one module, and then we keep using the same module to have a very deep model. All right, so in a nutshell, this is what a vision transformer uh, look like. Um, to summarize, basically we break the image into a so small patch, and each layer a feature vector is becoming a token. Um, and we actually a small detail here is we also put the position encoding into each token token to indicate the spatial relation. So and then the token are the same token are used for KQV. That's why we call it self attention. And then we calculate global attention across all the tokens. All right, so that's basically what we have for image encoding. Um, we, around 10 years ago, we had the, we have the finding that the convolution network can do very well. And it can, even though the components itself is very simple. Um, and the residual connection is a very interesting finding in the, in the convolution network. And even in transformer, it's also become relevant. And recently, instead of doing transformer, instead of doing convolution, we are using glo global connection instead of local connection to construct the attention mechanism and then build a vision transformer or build a transformer structure to build the model differently. All right, so let's conclude our first part for image encoding. I hope that now you have all the information to enter our second part, which is instead of only getting one label for the whole image, we want, to det we want to know that where, uh, what objects there are in the image and where they are in the image, which that's uh, object detection. Uh, okay, uh, do we have any questions? Hey, so I'm not uh, very familiar with the, uh, the vision transformer, but I know that's the basic of transformer. So when you apply transformer to the get NLP test, uh, you need to convert your input into like from words to vectors, right? Yes. Before feeding into the encoder. Yes. And in case of vision transformer, do you need to do that as well? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's basically what we are doing right here. So um, in language, you have to parse each, each word into a, like a word vector. But here we actually do it more naturally. We just uh, extract the 16 by 16 patch and treat that and flatten, flatten it to become a vector. And then we say that that is a token. So do you, you don't need to like transform like from one space into another space like in the, in the uh, language case? Well, I would say the the transform part is kind of, is a cute name, uh, but it's very uh, ambiguous. So everything can be seen as a transformation. Even in convolution, we can say, say that, okay, uh, we transform the image into the boundary space or into a gradient space. So 
But in that sense, yes, uh, whenever we have some linear operation on the token, then we can say that it is a transformation. I see. So the linear projection has weights that you need to train? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is there any intuition as to why residual connections work so well? Residual connection works so well? Yeah, apart from the fact that you can train up to 100 layers of ResNets. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any other intuition as to why it works so well? Okay, yeah, there are many theories about this, um, but here is one explanation. <laughs> Uh, for a very long time, the re people hypothesis, or actually observe, that the reason we cannot train very deep model is because either we, when you have a deep model, the gradient will either explode or vanish. Which means that, say, if you, have, if you stack 3 by 3 convolution 100 times, then when you train the model, uh, the gradient propagates to the like, early stage, the several first layers will be very small, usually very small or it can be gigantically large. So that is the famous uh, exploding gradient and vanishing gradient problem. And that's actually lead to the invention of LSTM. Like the, that's way before we have AlexNet. Like that was invent, observed and studied in the 90s. Um, and uh, that, is, uh, that is believed the major difficulty of training very deep models. So what, re what ResNet um, solved there is Let's say you have this residual connection, and uh, let's say virtually your output is directly connected to the first layer. It just have this shortcut to the first layer instead of going through all the, um, all the layers in between. And therefore, that can give you the, it can be effectively avoid the vanishing gradient because I can calculate the gradient to the first layer directly. So, um, and also some people say that uh, with the, uh, with the residual connection, essentially we are ensemble many models with different depths together. So for example, if you have 10 layers, let's say you have 10 layers and each layer has a re residual connection, then essentially you are ensemble a model of one layer, a model of two layer, model of three layer, and then you train, like you train them together and then you ensemble the results. So that's another like a view of this. Thank you. Uh, any more questions from the floor? <laughs> okay. I can see fine now. Let me continue. <laughs> All right. So, operator detection. So, operator detection is actually the next front, immediate next frontier when we realize AlexNet or deep learning can work on uh, image classification. So, before we have, we understand, we fully test or fully verify the, the model, deep learning model on object detection, we won't be convinced that the deep learning model is able to, mo is able to capture all the complex relation on a single image. Basically, in other words, so in image classification, we only need to have one label for the whole image. But for detection, we need to have various numbers of label uh, results for each image depending on how, how complicated the image is. And uh, in a lot of cases, we have to, we, people believe that the correctly predicting the object, uh, say, category in detection, also depending on the context. For example, if you see something is uh, on top of a horse, then very likely that is a rider. That won't be another dog. <laughs> so, um, and therefore, after we realized, okay, deep learning can work for image classification, there was a risk for detection. And also because detection itself has many applications, there have been many works in this area. And this is the general uh, structure or say general uh, trend in object detection. So we have basically two threads of this. We have a two stage method and a one stage method. Um, and we, I will explain what are they actually. But as you see, there are many, many ideas and many, many models in detection, such that in nowadays, if you want to detect some common objects, like uh, all the people in this room, then it's actually become a, a very solvable task. 
So the first thing, is, the first idea of doing this is called the region uh, with CN or RCN. So you may have heard of a lot about RCN, but this is the full name. It's region regions with CN, and it goes like this. So it's trying to do the transfer learning from image classification, and it's a two-stage method. It will first extract the region of interest for potential object locations, and then use the image classification to extract the features. So it look like this. So it's very from nowadays uh, nowadays perspective, it's actually very naive, but it actually breaks through at that time. So it will first uh, extract regions of proposals. Basically, we do say do a segmentation of the image and find out which region potentially can contain an object. Then we take the region, no matter how big the region is, we we will resize them into a square, like 250, 250, uh, 224 by 224 square and pass them into a CN model, like a Alex, AlexNet. And then after that, we classify whether this is, uh, what is the object, whether it's a person, whether it's airplane, et cetera. Um, and the reason proposal at that time is actually hand designed. So we, turn, we can turn to several uh, different uh, methods, either based on the graph based or based on some other type of methods. First, the idea here is we first break down the image into smaller regions, like super pixel or like a cut by boundaries. And then we try to see that which grouping of those regions is actually is the actual object. Um, yeah, so here I want to highlight that at the very beginning of a research, we always take small steps. Even though we are here using deep learning features, but in the end, to classify which object, the, the object category, we are still using SVM. So probably from now, this is a laughable, laughable thing, but that's actually the exact right thing to do at the very beginning when we try something new. So, and then people, like after we, like after the success of RCN, basically it's improved the performance of the deep learning models by, a, a deep, improving the performance on standard benchmark of object detection by a large margin, just like in classification. Then many people study that how we can do better region proposals. And as we mentioned, as I mentioned at the very beginning, so in the end, if we want to do something well, then you want to do a different learning model. Um, and uh, there are many works, say, let's first use a learning model to learn how to propose a region, and then use the model to extract the features. And then at some point, people realize, wait a minute. If we can use a deep learning model to extract the proposals and then use another model to extract the features, can we just put them together and then build a single model to do both the region proposal to extract the interesting regions and then classify each, and then classify each region? Um, that's, what we, that's what we later have the, called the fast RCN. And the key operation of fast RCN is called RI pooling. So it goes like this. Um, so with the first thing is we want to, uh, we call it a two-stage method because we first want to narrow down the number of windows or number of like regions we want to examine. And then like we want to see that uh, whether we can put these two things together. It goes like this. Um, let's say on the convolutional feature map, we can slide uh, at each location. We can like, basically try many different uh, ideas, which means that we hypothesize the, the object may look like a box, or uh, like a square. It can be a rectangle, or it's rectangle in the like a landscape mode. Basically, we do not know whether there's an object here, or what is how big the object is. But we can say enumerate different uh, possibilities. Then for each enumeration, we will give a score, saying that uh, how likely there is a square, square object at this pixel, how likely there is a rectangle which is portrait at this level. And of course, we need to try the box at different uh, scale, like a box of this size, box of this size, box of this size at different pixel. Um, and the base, here we, uh, in the real model, we try, uh, we have nine choices. Like basically, we have three skills, and for each scale, we uh, try different uh, uh, object size or different aspect ratio. 
then for each uh, box candidate, we will score them and uh, see that what will, how likely this box is actually really containing the targeting objects. Uh, and also, we will do a refinement here. Uh, the four, four, uh, the four coordinate refinement. Basically, the goal here is I start with the bounding box like the initial box like this. Uh, if I know that, or if I believe there is an object here, so what will be a refined location or bounding box for added for this thing? So to give you a better idea of this pooling, uh, I want to I do a, I can give you an illustration here. So because this ROI pool is essential for many, many computer vision tasks. So first of all, uh, we track features with some down sampling ratio. So usually this down sampling is down sampling by eight or down sampling by 16. So it's divided the image by like in a grid. And you can imagine that each location represent, uh, is represented by a long feature vector. But let's just for the case of, for the sake of simplicity, uh, let's say we only have one dimension and we want to have a region of features here. So the first thing we, let's say this is the box we predict from the, from the um, <laughs> this is the box we predict from here. And what do we do next? So let's say this is the box. We first divide the box by uh, resolution. Let's say we want to extract a two by two feature for this box. And then we have this fit box, we do divide it by two by two. Uh, let's say we have uh, certain values within each area. And here, this is why we call it pooling. Within each region, we will pool the value, either by max pool or average pool to get a two by two value. And sometimes you may say, okay, my predicted bounding box is not perfectly aligned with my feature grid. What can we do there? So we, what we do there is we just uh, we can run the cell coordinate and then still do the maximum pooling for that and basically use this pool feature to represent the original the grid or the grid we want to use. So of course this is a very coarse uh, representation for the object, and the uh, the magic here is uh, is making the tra right trade off in the sense that it can propose the right feature and it can propose the right bounding box and extract the right feature that is good enough to make a big improvement in predicting where the final bounding box is. So uh, pu putting things together, this is the, our final model for fast RCN. And actually in many scenario, even though the model has been like, has already very old, but it has been widely, still widely used. Um, it's usually passed the image by a backbone, like basically an image encoder, and then pass this into the RPN that we just described to, to use different anchor box to propose the, the object region that can contain the targeting objects. And then we pass the possible region into uh, using the ROI, uh, well, using ROI pooling to get the feature. Later we will de describe what is ROI align. Um, and then for each feature, we will pass another model to do, to do a further classification and refinement. Basically, we want to know that, say, among all the possible regions, which region are actually containing the targeting object. So usually, let's say, the image may have 20 target objects, like with different vehicles, different persons. And then we will extract the 100 or 300 regions, and then pass those regions into the bounding box head to do a further classification. So another very important technique in this is called the feature pyramid network. Um, usually the last layer of CN can downsample the image by a large ratio, by 32 or by 16. So this can prevent us from finding small objects. So sometimes the ob if the object is say size eight by eight, then it's already lost in the downsampled feature map. Then IPN is the way to try to combine information from multiple levels, both the like spatial and semantics, to come back this issue. So it's actually uh, look like this. So remember that I, re I introduced that no matter how fancy the technique or the layer we use, usually the model 
the model is can uh, it can be divided into uh, different levels uh, with different resolution. And what FPN does is so instead of only predicting the feed bonding box on the last level, we recursively combine the last level with the previous level to form the feature map of high resolution. And then we look for the objects at this scale. So originally, we do the anchor box and then at each pixel, we try to predict a uh, box of different scale. Um, and here, we can assign the bonding box into proper scale such that we can say if we want to detect small objects, we can look at the lower feature, uh, the, the lower feature map. If we want to find bigger objects, we can look at the higher feature map. Uh, and the combination is actually very simple. It's essentially just to say take this feature map and then naively, naively down sample, uh, up sample the, the feature map by two and then pass and then do an addition of the process the uh, layer of uh, of higher resolution. So again, this is a very simple uh, operation, but we find that it's actually working quite well. So we mentioned that this is a two-stage method. So we first uh, extract all the possible re regions of interest from the image, and then we process each uh, region in uh, independently to see that which, actually, which region actually contain the real, op real object. So this is used as one way to save computation because we can say when we process each individual object, we can, or when we process each individual region, we can use more computation. Um, but the one thing we are curious is whether we can do this more times. Let's say we first extract 300 proposals and then we process them such that we address the location whether we can use the address location to pull the feature again to, and then to predict a more accurate location of the object. So this is the idea of cascade RCN. So in fast RCN, so this is a, this is a simple view. Uh, in the RPN, we have a convolution layer to extract the features, and then we have the bounding box location from the RPN then we use this bounding box to pull from the uh, convolution features to do another further processing and then pl uh, classif to obtain classification and the bounding box. So in cascade RCN, what we want to do is say if, like say, if the put feature can improve, like say can improve the localization of the object, then we can use this better location to pull the feature again, and then do another prediction. And of course, after we have a new, new prediction, we can use it to pull again, and then do another fine prediction. This is um, more like, let's uh, say, originally we only have a core sense of, of, lo core sense of, of the location. And then after we have some refinement, we can use this refine the location, or refine uh, like body box to pull the feature, pull the feature again, to extract the feature from the feature map again, uh, and then predict whether predict the bounding box, and then we can assume that we can get a better bounding box location, then we can use it to get a more accurate pulling of the features. So it seems that the the process is actually improving the uh, the performance as we imagine, um, but only to a certain extent. So when we use the, uh, inter, uh, like only using a single layer, or a, sing uh, a, a single level pooling, we get 35.5 something. And then when we add more layer, when we more add more like uh, level poolings, we gradually improve the performance, but we are getting margin marginal return. Okay, uh, I think this is a good time to have a break.